Our next speaker is Leticia Caminero, who is an intellectual property lawyer and certified project manager with over 14 years of experience. She has extensive experience in the air, um, at the master's degree level in the areas including intellectual property, international intellectual property, WTO law and international environmental law and experience, as I mentioned, in project management. She currently works in the traditional knowledge division of the World Intellectual Property Organization and has previously worked within the region and in international organizations and regional organizations such as the Inter-American Development Bank and with the World Trade Organization. Her presentation today will be on traditional knowledge and intellectual property, looking at some practical examples. Leticia, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and, and for the invitation, of course, speaking. And I hope everyone in, in the region stays safe during the past of, of Fiona. I know my, my dear country has been affected, and I know some of you also may have uh, suffered the path of, of this uh, phenomenon. I hope everyone stays safe. Um, so today, um, as, uh, as I mentioned before, we're going to talk about um, practical examples where intellectual property is used uh, to protect or to safeguard or in benefit of traditional knowledge. So first of all, let's, um, okay. We're going to start with a short video that in the division we created to introduce traditional knowledge and intellectual property. So this video uh, talks about a, a fictional um, a, a fictional case in which traditional knowledge was used and how by the means of, of intellectual property, it was uh, it turned out to be an advantage for everyone involved. So let's uh, watch the video. Tucked away in a tropical rainforest, among the tallest trees and the smallest frogs, lives the Yakuanoi people. Like many indigenous peoples, they've developed their own unique set of skills, practices and innovations. Carefully passed down from generation to generation, this traditional knowledge forms an invaluable part of their identity as well as an economic and cultural asset for their entire community. One Yakuanoi innovation is particularly celebrated. Once a year in late spring, the Yakuanoi come together to begin carefully harvesting the rare Surian shoot. The vibrant green shoots are carefully separated from the leaves and roots and placed in large clay pots. Under constant care, the mixture transforms into an oily brown paste and the Yakuanoi have a new batch of their skin marvel that can be used to heal burns or skin conditions like eczema or even be used as an effective moisturizer, keeping skin looking youthful. Highly prized for its healing properties, the paste has always been bartered and traded in neighboring villages. And so, for many years, the Surian paste has formed the basis of the Yakuanoi community's economic livelihood. Word of the must-have Yakuanoi's paste traveled beyond the community. Always on the search of new and innovative resources, a cosmetics company researched the active ingredients of the Surian shoots. Impressed with its antibacterial benefits, they began to mass-produce an anti-aging face cream for distribution worldwide. Excited by its potential, the company quickly applied for a patent to protect its product and also registered a trademark using the name Yakuanoi. I had no idea that the traditional knowledge of my Yakuanoi people and the Surian shoot would have so much potential. Now in the city I call home, I couldn't help but notice advertisements everywhere for this new miracle face cream. Having left my community years ago to study law, I couldn't help but wonder, what does intellectual property have to do with traditional knowledge? Can and should intellectual property law protect it? The company has made an investment in their products, so what would be fair in a case like this? 
in search of a trusted source of information, my first step led me to the World Intellectual Property Organization. It wasn't long before it became clear to me that the intellectual property system can be used strategically to protect and promote traditional knowledge. Patents can be revoked if inventions are not new. Trademarks can be challenged if they confuse people. But it was also clear that there are limits to the existing intellectual property system that fortunately countries at WIPO are working on. WIPO introduced me to the local intellectual property office in my country, which was also very informative. It was time for me to visit my village and collectively decide our approach. I organized a meeting and we agreed to talk with the cosmetics company. We expressed our concerns that their anti-aging cream used our traditional knowledge. We also explained how their trademark was given the impression that the cream was an authentic Yakuanoi product, benefiting my community. This was not the case. After a series of productive discussions, the company agreed to resubmit their patent and trademark applications with the Yakuanoi as co-owners. This meant that profits and employment opportunities would be shared. While these issues are difficult and community experiences vary, I could return home proud of my community's traditional knowledge and with a new awareness of the need to make smart use of intellectual property rights. The more our communities know about intellectual property, the better our position to protect and promote our unique cultures. So with that, we can go through some basic um, understanding of what is traditional knowledge, what is traditional cultural resurrection, and what is genetic resources. So these are the working definitions that we that we use. So it is understand how traditional knowledge has knowledge, experience, skills, aptitudes, practices, abilities, innovation, and know-how, and so on. It, it, it is developed and maintained and transmitted from generation to generation. It's, um, it's a core part of a community and it's often part of the cultural or spiritual identity of that community. Um, it's not limited to a field. It's, it's, it can be from environment, medicine, genetic resources, cultural expressions, agriculture, and so on. So traditional knowledge, is, it, it could be across any technical field. And the, the key of, 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 this, um, of this work in definition is that it's knowledge that is maintained, developed, and transmitted within a community from generation to generation. Then we have traditional cultural expressions, which is the, only, the, the other key term. And this is a manifestation, is a form in which traditional culture manifests itself. It can be tangible or intangible or both, and is in constant development because has society as well is in constant development. Um, it can, it's, it's part of the identity and the patrimony of a traditional community or indigenous peoples and its origin is from generation to generation, and it cannot be pinned down to one person on one specific author. Genetic resources, in, in the other hand, um, are defined in Article 2 on the Convention of Biological Diversity as genetic material of actual or potential value. Genetic material is defined by itself as any material for plant, animal, micro, uh, vital, origin containing functional units of a heritage. So anything that is a unit of, that can, can be regarded as well as genetic, um, genetic material in which has um, actual potential value to be genetic resources. Um, intellectual property 
provides certainty and it can provide incentive to use genetic resources or genetic materials um, in biosciences and other applications. Um, so interactive breath can serve as a tool to use and to properly uh, exploit genetic resources. And now the relationship with intellectual property. Intellectual property um, in general protects the creation of the mind. So in broad terms, traditional knowledge is an intellectual product. So it can be subject to protection under intellectual property. However, the current intellectual property has other speaker mentioned before, it's it was not conceived with the idea of protecting traditional knowledge. It was conceived with the idea of protecting innovation, originality, and, and, and new developments. So the, the current um, regime doesn't particularly adapt to the needs of traditional knowledge. For that, we can have two paths. We can either adapt the existing conventional intellectual property um, to suit traditional knowledge, traditional cultural expression, and traditional knowledge related, and the protection of traditional knowledge related to genetic resources, or we can create a new sui generis special regime in which traditional knowledge can find um, a suitable protection. So with all this concept in mind, now we're going to talk about the, the core of the presentation, which are the practical examples in which intellectual property system has been used to protect, to safeguard, and, and some other what prevent um, uh, misuse of traditional knowledge. The first case we're going to talk about is a trademark. Um, it's about trademarks. So just to give you a few uh, pointers regarding trademarks, trademarks are um, usually protected first come first serve. So whoever files first for registration usually uh, prevails in the right of obtaining uh, of, of, of obtaining exclusive rights over a trademark. There are some exceptions, of course, but that's the general rule. Once you have a registered trademark, you can prevent from, from use. You can prevent others from using your trademark in commerce. And in, with that, you can prevent uses that can be offensive of the of deceptive of such trademark. The function of a trademark is, this, is, is to be distinctive in the in in trade, so it is uh, it is used as a sign to distinguish products and services from one enterprise to the other. So from from one uh, from one source to the other, the trademark is used to 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 make that distinction in the market within the consumers. And a trademark um, can be um, commercialized in in many ways by the owner itself, but it can also be licensed to be uh, commercialized or to be used in trade by other authorized people. With this idea, uh, we have two main examples. We have uh, the New Zealand example and the Andean community example. So in 2002 in New Zealand, um, there was an act was enacted in which trademark registration will not be allowed if it's, in, if it's likely to offend a significant section of the community, including the Maori, which has the indigenous peoples of New Zealand. So in this um, example, um, the New Zealand took the existing conventional IP system and adapted in a way to protect misappropriation or, pro or protect someone else taking advantage of registering rights who are, who are uh, belonging to this community. On the other hand, in the Indian community, which is, confirm, it's, it's, um, consisting of Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru, um, there's a decision in which um, it, is, um, it is settled that it cannot be registered as a trademark if the sign constitute an expression of indigenous, Afro-American, or local communities, cultures, or practices. So this too prevents uh, someone else from acquiring, registering a trademark in detriment of uh, a traditional or local community, Afro-American or indigenous community. Now we're going to talk about another example using in, in the same world of distinctive signs, but specifically in collective uh, mark or certi and certification marks. So collective marks and certification marks are part of the world of, the of distinctive signs, which is um, 
with the same uh, word that belongs to trademarks and also brand names, uh, trade dress, and so on. So the particularity of collective uh, marks and certification marks is that it is possible, as the name says in the first one, to, to use collectively. So it's possible for association, for a group of people, for a, a, um, a cooperative and so on, they can use the trademark in uh, as a collective, as a group of people. And it often certifies some characteristic of the goods. So a collective mark can be used to certify authenticity, can be used to certify um, origin, uh, as well as certification man can be used to, um, to certify or to verify that it comes from a specific lady or, or, it, have, or it has a specific, um, a specific um, conditions or a specific um, 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 elements of, of that product. Then it's there's a possibility of joining marketing as we can use collectively, it can also be um, used in the market collectively. And it is it is it is needed not only by registering a, a traditional um, a collective trademark or a, a certification trademark, it is not enough. So you need to after the, um, the user has a collective, you can you can raise awareness, you can um, educate the public about this collective uh, mark or the certification mark and what it means when a good or, a, or, or when a product um, has this mark on the label. And it's from this um, awareness raising and for this educating the public, you have um, a consumer recognition. So once, um, once then the, the consumer understands what the collective mark or the certification mark means in the product, then they're going to have a recognition and you can build customer loyalty on, on that regard. On, on, this, um, on, on, on this type of intellectual property, we have a very interesting um, example, which is a certification mark from Kowikan. Uh, Kowikan is a tribe um, located in Canada, in Vancouver, Canada. Um, and they have registered since 1996 a certification mark. The certification marks verified that any, pro any product that bears these certification marks has been used, has been um, produced, and the, the, the products uh, in which it was, um, it was um, uh, manufactured by, they all serve, they all are in accordance with the traditional tribal methods of manufacture. So that means that um, it's, it's usually um, used in clothing. So that means that the sweater, vests, ponchos, hats, uh, mittens, scarves, er everything that bears the certification man, uh, uh, it's saying that it has been um, manufactured and it has been authorized and it has in, and is in compliance with traditional tariff methods to create these items. So this allows this community to have um, a verification in the market of, um, of everything that is sold uh, and anything that is sold uh, under the certification mark, they're saying to the, to the consumers that it's in accordance with their tradition. Geographical indications by um, um, has in, in again in the realm of of, of distinctive signs um, are indications uh, used as well on products. They have the 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 particularity of claiming a, a specific geographical origin, and that origin it's uh, it links to quality, to characteristic, and to reputation. As well as the, the, the previous example, it can also be used as a collective and it's, it can help to preserve, to preserve traditional ways. However, traditional knowledge by itself, it is not protected in a geographical indication. So um, it is, it is um, identifying that is, that is used, uh, that, it, that is from a specific origin, that is from a specific place, but the method used to um, create that goods that bear the geographical indication, it is not protected as such. And uh, with that, you can, um, you can charge a premium price because you are indicating, you are certifying that it comes from a specific origin and it has uh, a specific qualities characteristic of reputation. So um, this requires a heavy implementation and, and it often requires 
a, a, a great involvement of, of the community that is behind the geographic identification. As an example for this, uh, we have the Mad de Casamance. This is um, um, this is um, a product from Senegal. So in Senegal, the, all the stakeholders that are involved in the production of uh, the MAD, they, they, they came together and they created an association. So this association was created for the protection and the promotion of uh, the geographical indication of the MAD de, Casan, de Casamance. And the purpose of, the, of this association is first to obtain the, the registration and the protection of this GI, and also to protect the forest, to prevent um, the, to prevent over um, harvesting of, of this particular uh, agricultural product, and also to raise awareness and provide um, and provide market access, specifically to women who who are traditionally the ones who are involved in the production and 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 in the in in the trade of this uh, of of these products. So uh, the mud the mud is a forest fruit, and it's specific for that area in Senegal, and it's a great it's 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 um it represents one of the main. Um, the main um, income contributions to the people in that rural um, area. So um, the process of, of creating this geographical indication is still ongoing, and you can find more in the source that I give here. So this is um, one an, another example how uh, GI's geographical indications can be used also to protect um, to, to protect a product that is related to uh, traditional knowledge. Then we have um, copyright. So in the copyright example, there are some particularities that we need to understand. Um, copyright protects, pro protects the expression of the original expression. So it doesn't protect the idea. It doesn't protect the, the, the concept behind it. So for example, the idea of, um, I would like to express as I would like, I would like to um, have a song which expresses the love for for one another. So this idea of a, of professing love through a song, it is not protected. But the way you express, the way you create different songs, different rhythms, and all that can be protected under copyright. And as well, artistic style is not protected either. So the way uh, um, the the in, in, in the painting, the way it is created, the way it is, uh, the silhouettes form or, or the way that specific colors are, are used in, our, in, a, in an expression, it's not protected by itself. It requires originality and it's, uh, the, the, con the conventional copyright uh, law requires an author. So it requires a person behind the, the original expression to be protected. And of course, it has, as, as any other IP, it has a term of condition that uh, needs to be met, often has a fixation requirement, which means that it needs to be fixated in a, in a tangible medium in order to be protected. Uh, but the good news about copyright is that contemporary TCEs, contemporary traditional cultural expression, can be protected um, e easily through this regime. Here we have um, an example of the of Ghana. In Ghana, uh, there's uh, there's there's a cloth named kente, in which is produced in the Asante ethnic group uh, uh, traditionally. And in 2005, the in Ghana it was introduced and uh, 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 in the Copyright Act of 2005, it was introduced a protection to the expression belonging to cultural heritage of Ghana, in which um, they are protected uh, against um, reproduction, communication to the public, adaptation, translation, and other transformation. So the same protection that you will find in other um, a, a copyright, conventional copyright rights, you will find also uh, for the cultural heritage of Ghana. And this uh, includes the ethnic communities of Ghana and has well unidentified Ghanaian authors. So in, in, this, um, in this example, the copyright regime was adapted to protect traditional knowledge. 
Finally, we have patents. So um, I've a quick overall on patents. Uh, patents, it's uh, can be defined as an exclusive right to a product or process that generally provides a new way of doing something. So it, it finds a new technical solution to a problem. And um, it is protected if the subject matter is patentable on the law. Uh, several law have different uh, meaning of what is patentable and different conditions for accepting uh, uh, a patent application. And it, it, it can be granted to any field of technology. So the three key conditions to obtain a patent are novelty, inventive step, and industrial application. So in novelty, it is required that a patent is new, that it's, it is not present and it's not, it's not in the body of existing knowledge of, of the specific technical field. And it's, uh, and it's not in, in the world that is called prior art. Then it requires inventive step, meaning that is that is not obvious to an ordinary person skilled in that art or a skill in that relevant field. And finally, it has to be um, capable of industrial application. So it cannot be just a theory, it cannot be just something that is abstract. It has to be um, able to be um, capable of industrial application. So with those three um, key conditions in mind, let's see how um, they see this case about the, the turmeric patent. So in the US, a patent was granted uh, on a, a method of promoting healing a wound of a patient, which consists essentially of administering a wound healing agent consisting of effective amount of turmeric powder to set patent. So a patent over the use of turmeric for this specific method was granted in the US. And in the patent application, the applicants acknowledged that this was based on a traditional medicine and a traditional medicine, a traditional a medicine, a treatment that was used uh, to strain an inflammatory condition. So they were, there was already acknowledgement of, of this, of the use of traditional knowledge. And when the patent application was examined, it was uh, considered novel and it was granted. However, um, the patent was, um, after it was gr granted, it was challenged, which means that um, they, they, they challenged the validity of the patent based of the lack of novelty. Uh, in, and for basing this claim, there was even, there was even included uh, um, um, the Asian Sanskrit text in which uh, turmeric it is described to use in this method that it was um, has well described in the patent. So um, eventually this uh, patent was found invalid due to lack of novelty. So in this example, we find a way of to, of to use the current uh, patent system to prevent misappropriation of traditional knowledge. And traditional knowledge, um, it is, it it is, it, it can be regarded as part of the prior art, and there are um, specific um, efforts in order to include a more effective way or include a more effective um, uh, um, access to traditional knowledge in order to prevent misappropriation of them and granting of patents that cover traditional knowledge. So if you would like to know more about these efforts or like to know more about uh, this information, I'll leave you here, the links on that regard. And finally, uh, I would like to end this presentation to talk about the work that we do in the traditional knowledge division at WIPO. So we have seven service areas in which we focus our work. We have facilitation of international negotiations in which Lily Claire just mentioned the great work that it is done in the IGC. So this is part of the support work that we do as well. Um, we also work with policy and legislative assistance to regional and national authorities. We work in engagement for indigenous peoples and local community, and we will see a bit more um, of that in the next slide. Uh, we also work with community enterprises program. We have a documentation of traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expression. 
and we have an IP rights management and in genetic resources and data. So we, we work in shaping the future of, global, of the global intellectual property ecosystem, reaching out worldwide and providing high quality knowledge. And we support the use of intellectual property as a tool for growth and sustainable development. And with that, the specific projects that we have, we have um, the, the training, mentoring and matchmaking program on IP for indigenous and local community women entrepreneurs. In, in this, um, we call it WEP for sure. In this program, we, we uh, train um, women entrepreneurs from indigenous people's uh, um, communities and from local communities um, and training not only on intellectual property, but also in, in other uh, very specific uh, commercial um, and, and useful aspects that they can they can use to put in to put in place in their projects and, and in their endeavors in order to have better uh, understanding of, of of the commercial world and to have uh, to succeed or to have better opportunities to succeed in in their endeavors. Likewise, we have a webinar series in which we talk with a very um, interesting speaker from all around the world to how to protect and promote your culture. Um, we also have uh, interactive property and traditionalist language pact in which all the publications and all the information and and very key informations for uh, for um, indigenous peoples and for local communities uh, to to learn about how they can use IP and how they can protect the traditional knowledge uh, through the, the existing IP system and all the different um, information that they may require in their own language. So here we have uh various um indigenous uh, languages in which it's it is it, it all publications are available and likewise we have other general publication and studies and documents that can really serve to understand better um this um this traditional knowledge and interactive property relationship and for more information you can always click on the link that i that i leave here underneath and <laughs> This is the end of my presentation and thank you so much for your time.